you know, I personally like the fact that translating gives me opportunities to meet people who are in different industries, you know? And then I just love a career that would bridge Japan and America. And Japan is my country, but America is where I call home. So anything I can do to help those two countries bring closer or together, I'm all for it. Welcome to Spark Joy, the podcast dedicated to celebrating the KonMari method and the transformative power of surrounding yourself with joy and letting go of all the rest. With your hosts and certified KonMari consultants, Kristen Ivey and Karen Sochi. And now, here's the show. Today's guest is Yuno Imai. Yuno is a Japanese food and travel writer and copy editor based in LA. We met Yuno in San Francisco when we completed our certified KonMari consultant training. The training was organized by KonMari Media Inc., and that's Marie Kondo's organization. The trainers and Marie, of course, were, are from Japan, and English was not their native language. So Yuno stepped in, and she was the lead translator for the three days of training marathon of of (laughs) translating and talking. And she played a big part in our learning experience. So you know, has tons and tons of really cool experiences that she's going to share with us today. And she's really not afraid of jumping into new things. And in addition to translating for Marie Kondo and her team, she's now living a life of joy and focusing on publishing a children's book. So we definitely want to chat with her about that too. Welcome to Spark Joy, you know. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome, you know. Nice to talk to you guys. <laughs> <laughs> nice to have you here. We were so grateful that you were able to step in the way that you did and translate for us during our Conmore consultant training. Oh. Um, you know, after we had another translator who was also great, had a part, and that you just jumped in and did it so flawlessly for us. It was super great. But I'm really curious, how did you get into Japanese to English translating? It's, it's such an interesting career. It sounds as though it's really both fun and challenging. Right. So, you know, since I was very young, I was just fascinated by American movies and music and I always wanted to be fluent in English and become a translator. So it, it it's really dream come true, but it is the most challenging job I've ever done in my life. You know, <laughs> when you <laughs> accept an assignment, you have to technically go in blindfolded because you don't know what you know, your clients would say or what comes out of their mouths. Right. So it requires a lot of, you know, focus and it's very physically demanding too. And, uh, you know, people don't realize how fast and how much they talk. And it's mm. hard to memorize everything and quickly translate them in my head and get them out of my mouth. So, yeah. So actually in 2016, I decided it was time for me to retire from translating. And uh, Marie was actually the last client I decided to take on. Yeah, that's so great. You know, I I can't imagine how difficult it must be. I mean, I I have enough trouble with English. (laughs) (laughs) And I I know that Marie, for example, was very accustomed to having people translate for her. Mm -hmm. But I can only imagine that translating for people who maybe are not so accustomed to it would be so much more difficult because they don't necessarily pause for you to translate in the same way that someone who uh, is experienced having translation done for them right. would do. Mm-hmm. That's so true. Yeah. I remember seeing you for the first time, actually, before I met you in San Francisco in on the Ellen show. Uh-huh. And you were translating when Marie was folding and demonstrating all the different major KonMari techniques. So you were right there when the book, The Life-Changing Magic of Tidying Up, first started gaining traction and popularity. Mm -hmm. What was it like really being there, you know, in the midst of of really Marie's message taking over the world? (laughs) You know, it was very unique experience and it was just fantastic, you know? Um, I was, when I was younger, I always said, you know, I'm going to retire translating once I become, uh, uh, once I get on national TV, 
So that was another <laughs> another gold moment. Check. Yes, gold <laughs> check, totally. So and then also I was, you know, transitioning from being a writer to author at that time. So it was just wonderful to see what a best selling author will go through, you know, doing all the media and stuff. And then our media schedule was so packed from the morning to night. So I got to spend a lot of time with Marie's team.、Um, They're just amazing people, and I still have close relationships with some of the、uh, team members as well. You know, you mentioned that you prep a little bit before you translate. I'm curious how、uh, you or if you were exposed to Marie Kondo and her books and teachings before jumping off and, and、um, translating for her. For either training or the appearances on TV, were you practicing、mm-hmm. Kumari? <laughs> so、um, I was always an organized person, so I didn't have trouble with organizing or anything. And I've actually you, don't 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 tell this to Kumari, okay? Okay, I, <laughs> just, I, between <laughs> just between us. Just between us. I've never. Heard of Kumari before I actually got this gig. Wow! <laughs> so after I got the gig, I bought all her books in Japanese and also in English. Read them all, you know, highlighted everything, learned about Kumari method, and then I went through all my clothes.、Uh, it was towards the end of the year, so in Japan we do end of the year cleaning.、Mm-hmm. So I thought it was you know perfect timing that I can test her method and also go through all my. Clothes, so yeah, I did try her method a little bit, and、uh, how she folds clothes in general—that's how I always folded clothes too, and how she organized them, and you know, place everything standing up,、uh, all that.、Uh, I already did it in my own life, so yeah, it it was it came natural to me, even though I've never translated for another organizing consultant or. People from organizing industry.、Uh, it was, yeah, I really enjoyed it. Yep, sounds like you caught caught the bug. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm wondering though, how were you were you surprised at how like enthusiastic all of us consultants were at the at the seminars? What was that like? You know,、uh, I think it was like a year after I started working with her when I started doing the seminars. So I. At that point, I already knew that people all over the world were crazy about Kumari and then her method.、Mm-hmm. Very cool. And I bet there's probably listeners out there who are interested in getting into translating.、Right. Do you have any suggestions for them, or like what is, you really love about the craft? Ah,、uh, you know, I personally like the fact that. Translating gives me opportunities to meet people who are in different industries, you know,、yeah. and then I just love a career that would bridge Japan and America. And Japan is my country, but America is where I call home. So anything I can do to help those two countries bring closer or together, I'm all for it, you know. And、uh, I guess if I were to give advice to people who want to do translating, just You just have to learn through experience. You know, I used to take small gigs here and there, worked with anybody from law to medical, not just all the fun stuff. So I think at the beginning you can't be picky. You just have to take on different clients, different industries, just to you know build your resume. Great advice. So, can, do you have any like amazing experiences where you translated something incorrectly or differently than, than <laughs> was expected? I mean, I guess that would, would that's the first thing that comes to mind is that something like that would happen. You know, I say one of the common not mistakes, but I think one of the things translators would do is just forget all the stuff. Your client said, <laughs> sure. "So sure. you know, because a lot of times they say not just one thing; they talk in sentences, and then as you translate, y- you tend to lose what you were, were going next. So I do my best to take notes,、um, but you know, it's just human's brain; it just cannot memorize 
too much information at once, I guess. <laughs> yeah, I remember you with your notepad during <laughs> the session. And I remember just trying to figure out how you were doing it. Like, I was just amazed. I was almost w- distracted by that. and wasn't paying attention to the content at some points because I'm just like, wow, how is she remembering all this and translating it? But, you know. It, it sparked a lot of joy for you to be there supporting us. <laughs> and we could have done it without you. <laughs> yeah. And I especially can imagine it would be difficult if it was subject or, you know, a topic that you weren't really familiar with. So it really sounds like a challenging job, but you certainly rose to the occasion. It was really super great. <laughs> Thank so, but you. Now I'd like to talk about your Instagram, which <laughs> is, um, you know, you know, you know. Did I do that right? Oh, I'm sorry. It's I know, you know, you know. There you go. <laughs> it's so, such a great name for your Instagram. <laughs> and this showcases your life of joy. And we can tell that you really value wellness and adventure above all else. And you're always trying something new like pole dancing, <laughs> aerial yoga, boxing, et cetera, et cetera. Have you always been so focused on health and wellness? And what are some of your favorite activities these days? Um, I, I guess I try my best not to stress myself out. So I don't focus too much on health or wellness. I just like to do whatever makes me happy. Go for the joy. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I take um, aerial silk, pole dance, yoga, kickboxing. I try to do it three to four times a week. Wow. But I'm not a fan of exercising and Gym is just one of my least favorite places on earth. (laughs) So, you know, whether it's gym or taking fun dance classes, you're technically doing the same thing, exercising. But Mm -hmm. I think it's important to find a joyful way to accomplish the same results. So, you know, lately I enjoy kickboxing a lot. It's very challenging and uh, doesn't come natural to me. I'm just not used to people trying to kick me or punch me <laughs> in my head. <laughs> so I'm always confused in a class full of strong men who are like pro boxers, but they inspire me so, so much. So I keep going back. Right. And so now that you also are concentrating more on your writing mm-hmm. and you're working on a children's book, can you tell us more about that project and what, what inspired you to head in that direction? Uh, sure. So I work as a food and travel writer. That's what I do for a living. And then I just simply love food, you know, eating, looking at food pictures or talking about good restaurants. I just follow what I love and I get many ideas for my articles. So same goes with children's books. I just love reading children's books and inspirations just naturally come to me. And I have so many stories I want to tell. (laughs) Wow. And, you know, I've always thought about this when I think about children's books. It, if I was to think about how to create a children's story, we, we could probably from the outside would say, oh, it's, it's easier than writing a full novel or a nonfiction book, you know, it's dense and long. Right. Um, but I imagine trying to condense an idea into this really the most simplified form for a child probably has its challenges too. Right. It's a, it's a different type of writing and art, you know. Mm-hmm. I write articles for publications. I I write for songs. It's just different forms and children's book looks easy to write because it's shorter compared mm-hmm. to novels and stuff. But yeah, it's, you really have to choose your words carefully because mm-hmm. the space is limited. <laughs> sure. <laughs> and what's been inspiring you lately when it comes to your writing? Ah, just, I would say life in general. I like to write about life, death, prison and food. (laughs) Wow, that's quite a range. (laughs) I know. (laughs) You know, I have a personal question to Mm -hmm. ask you while we have you on the podcast. I am going to be a new aunt probably in a matter of days now. (laughs) And what's really cool is my brother and my sister-in-law have really started to build a library for Mm -hmm. her um, already. 
So when I went to the baby shower in lieu of cards, they had this really cool idea where everyone brings a book and writes a special message in the book Mm -hmm. instead of like a Hallmark card or something like that. Ah. So I, of course, was the one that did not flip the invitation over and read the instructions to do that. (laughs) So I'm a little late with getting and collecting the latest children's book for my niece, but I guess, I mean, she's, she's coming in a couple of days, but I, I bet there'll be some time before she's starting to read. So I have a little bit of time. So I thought I'd ask you what your favorite children's books are, or if you have any recommendations for what I should pick up. Right. So I have two recommendations and they're, you know, obviously my all time favorite children's books. They are Red Shoes and then Rainbow Fish. So my mom told me, I used to love scary stories like Red oh, Shoes. Me and then too. <laughs> I wonder maybe that's why I like to write about death and prison and stuff. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> you know, they're both classics. And then in a good way, you know, one scary story you tends to, you know, scare kids or teaches kids something. But Rainbow Fish is very, you know, traditional, about kindness, universal stuff. So... Yeah. Hmm, very cool. I will look those up. I used to love uh, Scary Stories to Tell in the Dark. Mm-hmm. That was my favorite book. I used to read it until it was falling apart. <laughs> and the illustrations alone were so creepy, but it was one of those things you couldn't stop staring at. If you mm-hmm. like weird stuff like that, like I did. But yeah, it used to spook me out. Pretty creepy. Those are great. I will look at both of those uh, recommendations and we'll also link those in the show notes so our listeners can check those out too. Yes, please do. So, you know, Mm -hmm. can you tell us what at this very moment is sparking the most joy in your life? Well, I would say what sparks the most joy in my life right now is creating my children's books. You know, I love every moment and steps of it. It's a wonderful feeling to create something that might bring more joy to other people's lives or, you know, even as just as a writer, we want to create something that would live a century, you know, and I feel like I'm getting the opportunities to make my next dream come true. Very cool. And could you fill us in a little bit about what the book will be about? I, I don't want to spoil oh, it. Yeah, I know. To- totally. <laughs> but I'm curious totally. About the theme. Totally. <laughs> <laughs> the theme there will be death involved but it's, a, <laughs> it's it's not a scary story it's actually um based on a real event in my life the book is called Trevor and Me and it's based on friendship between my friend um Trevor who is a little bit older he's I think he's in his 70s. He would never tell me how old he actually is. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a you know, friendship story between myself and Trevor. And uh, he's actually the first friend I made since I moved to L.A. And we became very close over the last five, six years. And because of his age, obviously, he wouldn't be able to witness some of the special moments in my life, like, you know, my book signing tour, wedding, kids, all those fun stuff. So in the story, Trevor promises me, well, said as a young girl in the story, that after he leaves this world, he would transform into something and leave some kind of sign to let me know that he's always around me. So the message of the whole book is loved ones who crossed over are always around us. They're watching us. And also friendship knows no border, no age. So, you know, there's death involved, but it's a more heartwarming story. And I'm just hoping that readers will take the book and then gift it to their loved ones who just lost their loved ones, maybe to encourage them. Uh, I haven't seen any children's books talk about death in that way. There are a lot of books that talk about death, but not so much about reincarnation or, you know, uh, loved ones watching over us Mm -hmm. or transforming into physical forms, I guess. So. Yeah. I I feel like that is a message that needs to be written and shared. So it's (laughs) very cool. I'm very intrigued by this. And you said the book is Trevor and me. Me. Uh Uh-huh. Trevor and me. Awesome. So we'll look forward to seeing that very soon. (laughs) 
And do you have any parting words of wisdom? Um, you know, one of my favorite phrases to live by is positive attitude brings positive things in life. So I say, do what makes you happy and go after your joy. Oh, I love that. That's great. You can find out more about you know by visiting I know you know you know dot com. Updates on the launch of her first children's book will be made available there, and you can track you know's adventures and joyful lifestyle via her Instagram at I know you know you know. So now we want to hear from you. Tell us your burning tidying questions or share stories about how Kamari has impacted your life. You can find us at sparkjoypodcast.com and click Ask Spark Joy to leave a question or comment for a chance to be featured on next week's show. While you're there, sign up to join our Spark Joy podcast community and get notified when each episode airs. You can also join the Spark Joy podcast community on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at the handle at Spark Joy Podcast. Thanks for tuning in, and we hope your day sparks joy. Thank you for listening to Spark Joy with your host, Kristen Ivey of For the Love of Tidy in Chicago and Karen Sochi of The Serene Home in New York City. Spark Joy, the podcast is not endorsed by or affiliated with Conmari Media Incorporated. The opinions expressed on this episode represent the views of the co-hosts and guests alone and do not represent the corporate position of Conmari Media Incorporated or the Conmari Consultant Community.